Uh, mm, mm. Hi guys, how are you today? My name is Bailey Sarian and every Monday I've been doing murder mystery and makeup where I sit here, I get ready, where I talk about a crime case that I've been interested in, where I do feel like I would like to um, extend this to other days in the week, but right now it's on Mondays. I'm going to start doing my makeup and try my best. I need a mirror. Yeah, so it's February, it's Valentine's month. And I thought, you know, I could stay on that theme, I guess, and look up murder cases that have happened around Valentine's Day or on Valentine's Day. And I did find this case. Don't forget to like and subscribe, I guess. Also, a lot of you guys have been asking me what products I'm using throughout the tutorial. Just so you know, down in the description box, I have been listing the products that I'm using. I'm gonna try and be better and list brushes as well. Okay, so let's get into it. Dr. John Hamilton was known for being a romantic, very devoted to his wife. He loved his wife and for being rich. I just added that part in, I'm sorry, but he was a very wealthy man. He was a doctor. On their wedding day, John surprised Susan with a poor, Porsche. Do you say Porsche or do you say Porsche? We're getting off track. I'm gonna say Porsche. And throughout the 14 year marriage, he lavished her with vacations and gifts. According to friends and family, the Hamiltons appeared to be deeply in love. Dr. Hamilton, who was 37 at the time, was an OBGYN. When he met Susan, who was 39 at the time in 1985, they met at a friend's birthday party. Both were recently divorced and they both had two children from their previous marriage. So combined they had four kids. A coworker and friend of Susan's said Susan was intelligent, beautiful, vivacious, and people loved to be around her. She said that she would constantly tell coworkers or friends like, I wish I had someone look at me the way John looks at Susan because they just seemed so happy and they were in love. And this is like a constant theme throughout, like everybody reports how happy they seemed. Seems to be the case before somebody gets murdered. Two years after their first date, they got married at a local country club. The doctor and his wife built a very envious lifestyle for themselves. So they had a big old mansion. They had beautiful cars. They lived in a top notch neighborhood, but the Hamiltons did have enemies. In addition to delivering babies, John would also perform abortions at another clinic and Susan would manage that abortion clinic two times a week. The doctor had been targeted by a couple of anti-abortion groups. Then came Valentine's Day 2001. John came home between surgeries that morning to pick up his date book that he had left at home. And he was horrified to find his wife laying on the bathroom floor in a pool of blood. John started to perform CPR on his wife and then he called 911. In the 911 call you hear him crying, just yelling over and over again, send the police send an ambulance, I think my wife is dead. And then he tells the 911 dispatcher that he is trying to perform CPR. When paramedics arrived, it was a sickening scene. Susan was laying in a pool of blood. Oh, I forgot to add a disclaimer. Okay, disclaimer, this true crime murder story does contain some pretty, just graphic descriptions of what happened to poor Poor Susan, forgive me for being a little graphic. So Susan was laying in a pool of blood. She had been strangled with two neckties. Her head had been smashed with so much force that parts of her brain were exposed. So it was tragic. Over the next few hours, investigators would try to understand what happened. Was it an intruder? Was it a robbery? Was it the anti-abortion group targeting the doctor and his wife? they kind of were leaning more towards that one because just one week before Susan was murdered, a wanted poster had been faxed to John saying dead or alive with John's face on it. And it was from the anti-abortion group. They also received a bunch of threatening phone calls um, from the group as well, or just members of the group. Somebody had tried to set fire to the abortion clinic just two days prior to the murder. So investigators obviously felt like, okay, let's look into this situation. And 
it's got to be something with that. I mean, all signs are really pointing to them. As routine in domestic murders, the detectives would take a look at the spouse, of course. So John was considered a suspect and he had a really strong alibi. John had been up at dawn for a 7 a.m. surgery at another outpatient clinic. Afterwards, the doctor decided to swing back home because he had a little bit of time. Then he had to be at another um, hospital to perform another surgery at 9.30. He didn't leave the first outpatient clinic until about eight at the first location. And then he said he stopped and spoke to a friend until about 8.30. He went home and then he was gonna go straight to his other surgery at nine. It was reported that he was only home for a few minutes because then his pager went off and it was the hospital um, paging him to come in for now his next surgery. By 9.30, he was already back at the office scrubbing up for his next surgery. And later, the doctors and coworkers would report that nothing seemed off with John, just another normal day, like he was good. By 1045, John was on his way home and that's when he discovered Susan in a pool of blood. The timeline was really tight. So as far as him being able to commit a murder, clean up and get back to work seems not impossible, but very difficult. So he wasn't ruled out as a suspect, but he definitely wasn't the one that they were mainly leaning towards. Investigators found a Valentine's Day card from Susan in John's Jaguar, and they thought it was really suspicious. It was just, it was a weird card. Susan wrote in the card, I bought my card two weeks ago, so I guess maybe they don't seem as appropriate now, but I do love you. Have a good day, Susan. So, it seems like maybe their relationship wasn't as perfect as everyone made it out to be. Susan's friend and neighbor, her name is also Susan, try not to get confused. She said that she spoke with Susan one week prior to her murder. Susan, the wife, had expressed that she thought maybe John was being unfaithful. She noticed that John was getting a lot of cell phone calls, but he wasn't answering them. He would like look at it and ignore it. And when Susan kept pressing John about it, he finally said, it's just a patient who was like having a hard time down on her luck and he was just trying to help her out. Susan though discovered that it was not a patient, but instead it was a stripper in a nightclub. I was trying to dig, like how did she figure out it was a stripper? And I don't know. Susan then looked through John's cell phone records and realized that they had been talking a lot and there were over a hundred calls um, out to this stripper and to him as well, so back and forth. So then Susan decides to confront John about it. And of course, John had his reasons. He said that she was a patient and she was having serious problems and she was even contemplating suicide. He was just simply trying to help her out and if he crossed any boundaries, he was really sorry, but he did not have an affair with her. There really is no proof if he had an affair or not. There were a lot of phone calls, but that was all that was really reported. They had interviewed the stripper and she even said that there was no affair, so. Who knows? Susan, the neighbor, tried to convince Susan, the wife, to let it go that John is like obsessed with her and she's just being paranoid about nothing, that she just don't worry about it. Terrible advice. I've just been blending my eyeshadow for so long because I'm kind of stalling. I don't know what to do on my eyes. So investigators decided to investigate, as they do, John a little bit further because now they have this inside tip about, okay, the marriage wasn't what everyone's making it out to be. And they thought that his behavior was strange. You see, when John had called the 911 operator, he said that he was giving Susan CPR. But when the first responder came onto the scene, who was a firefighter, he said that John, I'm sorry for laughing, this is not funny. He walked over, well, he came over to where John was at. John was performing CPR. John had his one hand on her chest, one hand on her stomach, and was pressing up and down, trying to give her CPR that way. 
Maybe you don't know how to perform CPR and that's okay. But I think for the most part, like a lot of us know that that's not how you give CPR. But maybe I'm also assuming. The first responder told investigators like, yeah, John over here was trying to pump her stomach and her chest, I guess, and said he was giving CPR. Okay, if he's supposed to be giving CPR, he would be giving her mouth to mouth. The scene was bloody, right? There, it was horrific. There was blood everywhere. And Susan's face was completely swollen and bashed in. If he were giving her mouth to mouth, he would get some kind of blood on his face and there was nothing on his face. Suspish. Investigators put John into the back of their car because they're gonna take him down for questioning. And John was continuing to act quite strange. He was scraping his knuckles on the mesh screen that was in the back of the car and he was pounding his face against the screen as well, hurting himself essentially on, you know, on the back of a police car, they have that screen. He was rubbing his fingers on it, smashing his face into it. They ended up taking him down to the station where he could be questioned. They took his clothes as evidence. They placed him into the interview room. When watching John on the surveillance cameras, they noticed that checking his shoulder and like checking out his body to see where he hurt himself. And that's when they thought, oh, maybe that's why he was scraping his fingers on the, the mesh in the patrol car because he was trying to like cover up any type of injuries that he may have gotten earlier. And when they looked at his body they did notice that he had scratches on his shoulder so he was trying to either hide something or he was just acting different. Still though, John had a pretty solid alibi. He had a busy morning performing surgery, not one surgery, he performed two surgeries that day. But detectives looked more closely at that time gap he had and they saw a hole. Detectives have learned that the second surgery was actually scheduled at 9 a.m. in the morning, but it didn't actually go underway until 9.40 and it was delayed because John was late. They had a client under anesthesia and they realized that John still wasn't here. And then that's when they paged him saying, where are you? To investigators, that delay opened up the doctor's window of opportunity by an hour. So late that Valentine's day, they arrested John Hamilton for the murder of his wife. I'm moving at a very slow pace today. You see, like I'm having a very hard time. John was jailed immediately and also denied any bail. The case now landed in the hands of Wes Lane, the district attorney who would try Dr. John Hamilton for murder. The prosecutor was well aware of the hurdles. There was no murder weapon and there was a big lack of motive. You see, they tried to find some kind of motive. They dug in John's history to try and find anything like past abuse, anger issues, previous arrests, anything that would show that he could possibly do this. They asked friends and the neighbors, did they ever see John snap? Just lose his temper, go crazy. Come on, give us anything. Out of all the people that they interviewed, they all said the same thing that they just didn't think John was capable of doing this. They were so in love. They've never seen him angry. They've never seen him do anything. And from what they all knew, the marriage was perfect. Besides Susan, the neighbor, she was the only one to report that maybe there was something going on in the marriage. But other than that, they had nothing on this John guy. Naturally, you would think, okay, he's gonna go like run away with the stripper and live a happy life. Even the stripper was like, no, there was nothing going on with us. So there's just nothing. Prosecutors were gonna have a hard time proving that he did this. December, 2001, 10 months after killing his wife, Susan, Dr. John Hamilton was being tried for her murder. So the story that the prosecutors are going with is that on Valentine's Day, John received that card, that Valentine's Day card from Susan, and it lit a fuse for the violence that followed. In that card, Susan wrote something suspicious. So John, coming back mid-morning after his first surgery, tried to patch things up with his wife and she was not buying it. She was like, no, nope, wasn't buying it. John, he knew that she was considering divorce and then something happened in the bathroom that really triggered him to just go off. He grabbed the ties, he then surprised her and in his rage, it's when he strangled her and like just went off and 
Now the doctor, according to prosecution's version, had to cover by going to his next surgery as though nothing happened, which anyone in their right mind would have a probably really hard time doing. So John would have to leave the house by 9.20 to make it to the doctor's office by 9.30, because that's when he was seen washing his hands in the sink. Susan, as it turns out, had plans that day as well. She had a meeting at 9.30, so she had to leave the house at 9.20. The friend was close by, it was 10 minutes away. When Susan was discovered, she was undressed and her hair was still wet, which means she was getting ready to go to this meeting. So if John didn't do it, you would have to believe whoever did arrived once John left or had been waiting inside all along. Also in crime scene photos, prosecutor pointed out something that was odd. It was a wet rag that was left in the pool of blood. It looked like someone had started or attempted to clean up, but then get like gave up midway through and just abandoned trying to clean it up as if they had to go somewhere. So pretty much the only thing that they could go off of was the blood spattering. So they hired a blood spatter expert. So Ross Gardiner had carefully examined everything that the doctor had been wearing that day. A lot of the blood on his clothing did go along with the story. Like it looked like he was trying to give her CPR and the blood that was on him seemed to come from that. Examiner also said that his shoes were suspicious. The left shoe, in particular. The shoes were found next to Susan's body. John said he took them off when he was trying to revive Susan. The expert could tell that the inside and the front of the shoe was in motion when blood was splattering and radiating outwards. But the most damning evidence of all was that inside of John's car, there was blood, hair, and skin or pieces of her flesh on the driving wheel, on the door of his car, also on the seat of his car. Investigators determined that it probably came from when he packed up his stuff to go to work. He also brought the murder weapon with him and was gonna drop it off somewhere before he headed back to his second surgery. So naturally John had a reason as to why that was, why the blood and everything was in his car. He said that when he was performing CPR on his wife, he called 911 and he was telling them like, come quick. He then realized that his car was blocking the entranceway to the house. So he stopped performing CPR apparently, went outside, got into his car and was gonna move it. So the EMT could come into his driveway. And that's why all the blood and stuff was in his car. One unanswered question though was how the hell John got out of the house into the car without leaving a bloody trail? Officers said that there were bloody footprints inside the house, but outside leading to a car or anything, there was nothing. The investigator testified he thought the killer first took a shower, then he let the water run to get all the, the blood and everything out of the shower. Then the killer poured cleaning solution down the drain to get rid of all signs of blood, changed into clean clothes and concealed the bloody clothes in a bag, carried them out of the house, turned up the heater in the house to evaporate any water that was in the shower. So no one would know they took a shower. There's physical evidence missing from the crime scene. So they know that someone had to leave and that was only speculation, the shower and everything. That's just the story they could come up with. John's team knew that this was not looking good for them, okay? The blood spatter expert is saying that John's shoes are giving him away essentially. So John's team decided to hire one of the most highly regarded blood splat splatter experts out there, which was Tom Bevel. So John's team brings him in in hopes to prove John's innocence. Let's hire the best of the best because John doesn't wanna go to jail. The blood expert was the last witness to hit the stand and everything that he said actually ended up helping John. So he was saying that the blood stains on the shirt do look like it, come, it came from trying to give CPR to his wife. Without a murder weapon, it's hard to tell if any of the blood spatter came from um, the murder weapon. Most of the blood on him was from what he said he was trying to do. So it was looking good for John. John was like, yes, this is why I hired this guy. Then came the prosecutor. Okay, let me tell you, cross examination. The prosecutor asked the blood examiner. He said, is there anything else that you want to mention to us that maybe that was missed? So would you like to share anything that you may have found? Now the blood expert was on John's payroll. So naturally he's like, dude, 
sorry, bud. In my mind, that's what he said. Tom answered, yes, there is something that was overlooked or missed. Tom said that in examination, there was blood that was not talked about or mentioned. And it was inside the right cuff of his shirt. The blood spatter that was in his sleeve was consistent with John Hamilton beating his wife with some kind of, some kind of weapon. And it was driving the blood, the splatters up his shirt. So John's hired expert that was supposed to help him out had just proven that he was guilty. So John's lawyer quickly tried to defuse the bombshell that just went off and suggested that the spatter may have come from trying to perform CPR and all that stuff. But his argument was not enough and the jurors spent two hours reaching their verdict. Two weeks later, John was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. John had tried to hire a new attorney to appeal the verdict. Their appeals made it all the way up to Supreme Court, but but they ultimately failed. Today, John Hamilton is in a maximum security, security, sorry. Today, John Hamilton is in a maximum security prison and he, as of right now, is there for life. Look, let's talk about it. Just like last week's murder, where it was kind of like, did she do it? Did she not do it? I'm kind of feeling that way about this case because one, what was his motive? He just snapped one day. All of the friends that they interviewed, nobody had anything mean to say about John, like nothing except for the neighbor, Susan, who mentioned possibly him having an affair. But the stripper and John, no one confessed having an affair. There was really no further proof that he was having an affair. There was no conversations that he was maybe planning another life. There was just nothing. The dude is already rich, so he didn't wanna like kill her for money. I don't know. The whole thing is just kind of like, hmm, maybe, maybe not. I was reading online some other people's um, input on the case and they were saying, well, maybe it was the stripper who killed her. Maybe she wanted to get rid of her so she can be the new wifey. I just feel like there would be some kind of like evidence leading back to her, right? Oh, confusing. I guess the moral of the story here is even if your partner is 100% squeaky clean, golden, he still might murder your ass. I mean, there's like no red flags with this guy. I'm so confused. What am I supposed to look out for? Let me know what you think down below. Rest in peace, Susan Hamilton. I'm sorry that nobody really knows what, what really happened. And that must be so frustrating. Hopefully she's on to a new and better place. I'm not very good at these things. This is why I could never speak at a funeral. I'd be like, yeah, so <laughs> hope they're good. I hope that you have a good day today. You make good choices. Be safe out there. And I'll be seeing you guys later. Bye.